My name is Dr. Deep Flow, and today I'm going to show you how to build a 3D printer. I've always been a strong advocate for building a 3D printer from either a kit or self-sourced parts instead of purchasing a fully assembled one. I recommend this route not only because you may save some money, but also because you will have a greater understanding of how your printer works. One of my mottos is that if you can build it, then you can fix it, and trust me, 3D printers require a lot of maintenance. In a sentence, this video is for people who wanna learn more about the components that make up a 3D printer and how to select these components to build or modify a printer. To help illustrate some of my points, we'll be walking through the build of Zydex. Zydex is a compact 3D printer that features two extruders that operate independently of each other. There are many benefits to this design over a printer with fixed dual extruders, which we'll discuss later. If you're new to 3D printing, don't let the dual extruders scare you away. I intend for this video to provide more general information on building a 3D printer. It'll be your choice to determine how many extruders you want to include. I found the unique design of Zydex to be a great teaching tool. Its use of three different rail profiles for the X, Y, and Z axes will motivate our discussion on linear rail. The undeniably small print bed will be a great segue into discussing 3D printer design criteria. A couple more comments before we get started. If you want to build this printer exactly to my specifications, then on my website is a bill of materials in a step-by-step -step guide with pictures. Personally, I find a text and picture manual format easier to follow than a video, especially when it comes to building something this complex. But let me know your thoughts. This printer was designed by Steven and the appropriate links are below for the original design that is unmodified by myself. I'm not gonna pretend that building a 3D printer is quick. As a result, this is gonna be a long video. To make it more digestible, it is broken up into standalone sections. Each section will begin with a general explanation which should help the newcomer get a feel for some of the considerations and requirements for designing and building a 3D printer. I will then proceed to provide too much information at the risk of boring you. Use the table of contents in the description to jump around to topics that you are most interested in. With that out of the way, let's get started. <laughs> Our first topic is linear rails, but I wanted to give a brief overview of the type of printer we are building. Zydex is a Fused Deposition Modeling or FDM 3D printer. This is the most common type of 3D printer at the hobbyist level. To oversimplify, an FDM 3D printer is really just a fancy hot glue gun that can be moved accurately in three dimensions. For a standard Cartesian 3D printer, we require at least one linear rail per dimension. There are other types of 3D printers that operate on different coordinate systems, but we are not going to worry about those today. If we compare the linear rails of the Zydex with my commercially available Maker Gear M2, you will notice the M2 rails are fastened to the metal frame, while the Zydex rails play a dual function as both the rails and the frame. Both of these approaches have their pros and cons, but it is unrealistic for a hobbyist to build the M2 frame. However, the Zydex rails are like an adult version of Kinex, which can easily be connected to each other to form a coordinate system. V-rails are a specialized form of T-nut aluminum extrusion. The T-nut is what allows for the V-rails to be joined together in an infinite number of configurations. I present to you the meaning of life. I assemble this piece of abstract art in about five minutes, but I'd be willing to part ways with it for a cool $5,000. All jokes aside, this rail is quick to assemble and works with other components, such as this rod clamp, which of course allows a linear rod to be joined with the aluminum extrusion. It's important to keep in mind that not all T-slot extrusion is set up to handle linear motion. V-rails can accept T-nuts, but also have a smooth V-groove, hence their name, that matches the contour of a chamfered wheel, known, as you guessed it, a V-wheel. To add to the confusion, my CNC router made by the company Inventables uses a different type of linear rail known as Maker Slide. Now, Maker Slide is still technically T slot aluminum extrusion, but it doesn't work with the uh, previously mentioned chamfered wheels. It needs its own special wheel. So, not only do you need to make sure that your rails are set up for linear motion, but you also need to make sure that you've got the correct wheel that's going to ride on the rail. There are many different profiles and lengths of V-Rail. The Zydex uses four different profiles of V-Rail, which I have purchased from the online retailer OpenBuilds. The four profiles used are 20x20, 20x40, 20x60, and C-Beam. Usually aluminum extrusion is named after its cross-sectional dimensions, hence 20x20 is 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. Of course, the C-Beam is an exception to this rule due to its shape but the increased cross-sectional area of the C-beam makes it more rigid and better suited for applications where the motion has to overcome resistance, like in CNC routing where an end mill has to cut through material. Further, each rail profile has its own set of compatible plates. These plates become carriages when you add V-wheels to them, 
Of course, wider rails will support larger plates, allowing for larger objects to be mounted and moved more stably. Even though aluminum is relatively light, CNC machines made out of aluminum extrusions become heavy quickly. In 3D printing, where the forces resisting movement are relatively low, smaller aluminum profiles can be used to save money and weight. <laughs> An alternative to linear rails are linear rods. In the context of 3D printers, it might even be appropriate to say that linear rods were predecessors for linear rails, at least at the hobbyist level. A couple years ago, it seemed like every 3D printer relied on rods for linear motion. And this is for good reason. Quality rods are more affordable and more available than linear rails. But most importantly, the linear motion bearing that rides on the rod is significantly cheaper than the wheels that ride on the V-rail or the ball bearing carriages that ride on a normal rail. I'm talking pennies on the dollar. We will cover V-rail carriages in the next section. With the cost being more, is there a reason to choose rails over rods? And well, yes, linear rails have their own set of benefits, like the fact that they only allow for one degree of freedom. For example, this carriage will only move forward and backwards and it will not rotate around its axis of travel. This is unlike a linear rod, where the bearing will move back and forth, but it will also rotate around its axis of travel. This is the reason why the demo has two linear rods. It prevents the carriage from rotating. Now I know this section is supposed to be about linear rods and I'm talking about the benefits of linear rails, but I think that talking about the benefits of linear rails illuminates some of the shortcomings of the rods and why many DIYers are moving away from linear rods in favor of linear rails. Let me discuss one more benefit of using a linear rail over a linear rod, and that is the ability to support the linear rail at any point along its path. Uh, so for example, I've supported this rail at both ends, but also in the middle. This middle support does not impede the motion of the carriage. This third support would make the axis you know, stiffer overall. Now only the ends of the linear rod can be supported. If I were to you know, put a support here, mimicked by my fingers, uh, this would actually impede the movement. Nevertheless, because linear rods have been used in 3D printing for so long, there are so many designs that have successfully used them. The Prusa i3 printers are some of the most popular printers on the market, and all three axes use linear rods, and the prints are phenomenal. What has really piqued my interest as of lately are 3D printer designs that are using carbon fiber tubes uh, as linear rods. I bought a couple of them, and man, these tubes are light and rigid. The one issue is that the outer diameter of readily available carbon fiber tubes uh, is a little irregular, causing a lot of friction um, as the linear bearing moves across it. To allow for the linear bearing to move smoothly, uh, you'd have to sand the carbon fiber tube, but you need to be very, very careful when sanding carbon fiber or even cutting it uh, because those particulates are hazardous. One of the reasons that Zydex doesn't use linear rods is because the linear rods have to be clamped to the frame. Now these clamps cause the rods to be about uh, two centimeters offset from the frame. As you can tell, Zydex is a very compact build and there's not uh, clearance for that extra 20 millimeters on both sides. You can see how close the extruders are. I think there's about a centimeter in between them. Because Zydex doesn't use linear rods, they probably won't be mentioned again in the video, uh, but when you're looking online, you're gonna see a lot of designs that call for the use of linear rods. Don't think anything less of them just because I'm not using them. As promised, our next topic are the V-rail carriages. We need a carriage or cart to ride on the rail to provide the actual motion. This topic wouldn't be as lengthy if we were talking about the ball bearing carriages used in the Maker Gear M2. Now you just simply slide the carriage on the rail and that's it. If there's too much play in the carriage, well you're gonna have to ask for a replacement from the manufacturer. If the replacement still wiggles too much, well then you're gonna have to fork up some more cash and purchase a more accurate set of carriages and rails. The point here is that this system is not adjustable. However, the opposite is true for the V-Rail system. Usually you purchase a plate and wheels separately, although kits do exist. All plates allow for at least four wheels to be attached, and some allow for more. In our first example, we had eight wheels. 
More wheels means more points of contact, which means a stronger overall assembly. However, more wheels also means increased friction that your motor has to overcome. So there's a trade-off there. Here's the big question. If DIYers are installing their own wheels, how can manufacturers ensure that all carriages fit snugly on the linear rail? Any wobble in the carriage would be disastrous to the final resolution of the printer. Well, if you can't make it perfect, then make it adjustable. The eccentric spacer is the magic sauce for this whole system of linear motion. Let me explain. If you notice, the bore for the eccentric spacer is not in the center, hence eccentric, not concentric. The eccentric spacer has a phalange which mates with the appropriate hole in the plate. The magic behind the eccentric spacer is actually pretty simple. Here I pushed a bolt through the back of the plate uh, and through the bore of the eccentric spacer. Obviously, the bolt is going to follow the bore of the spacer. So here it's pretty close to this uh, edge over here, but if I rotate the spacer 180 degrees, now it's followed that bore and it's closer to this edge over here. So effectively, what does this mean? Well, if we put a wheel on there, then we can actually you know, move the position of the wheel either away from this edge or towards this edge. Now if we stick a bolt on the other side, add a normal spacer, add another wheel, I'm gonna reset this bolt so that it's as far to this edge as possible. I'm gonna add some nuts so everything doesn't go flying around. So here, if we slide a rail through here, I don't know if you can tell, but the wheels don't rotate as the rail moves. It's a very, very loose fit between the rail and the wheels. So what we can do is move this eccentric spacer really either way to bring the wheel closer to this edge. Now you can see that moving the wheels moves the rail. A common question is how tight should the wheels grip the rail? And it's all about the index finger. The wheels should be loose enough that you can spin them with your index finger, but they should be tight enough so that the wheels don't spin freely. There should be some kind of proportional movement in the carriage as the wheels move. After installing the wheels, I recommend pushing the carriage along the full length of the rail you plan to use. If you notice that some sections of the rail, it's easier to push the cart than others, well then there could be an issue with the rail or wheels. It's better to find out now that there's a dent in a wheel or that the rail is a little bit warped than to find out after we install the belts, which we're gonna do next. <laughs> As I set up for our next topic on transmission, I've created this little demo where all three motors are instructed to go forward, then reverse the same number of rotations. By the end of this section, you will understand all three configurations and why the bottom plate covers the least amount of distance. The components that allow for the rotation of the motor to move the carriage linearly is what I'm collectively referring to as a transmission. Here's a quick primer on the two systems which are predominantly used in CNC machines, belt driven, and lead screw driven transmission. Let's talk about belt driven linear motion. A timing belt has teeth and these teeth will mesh with an appropriate timing pulley. The pulley in turn has a center bore which can accept the shaft of a stepper motor. When the stepper motor rotates, it rotates the pulley which moves the belt. Now how do you think the size of the pulley influences the distance the belt moves per rotation of the motor shaft? We will discuss the impact of pulley diameter in a bit. For what I would call a traditional looped belt style, we need a pulley on the opposite end of the motor. This pulley is known as an idler pulley because it spins freely. It has two functions. One, it acts as a belt tensioner, and two, it makes sure the belt remains in position. In other belt setups, the belt is fastened at either side of the rail. This configuration usually signifies a belt and pinion linear drive system. Look at how the motor moves with the carriage. Of the two belt configurations, the closed loop setup is the most common in 3D printing. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a 3D printer use the belt and pinion setup. And this is largely because the motor attached to the carriage is gonna change the inertia of the carriage and ultimately make the carriage more resistant to acceleration. So this is a great setup to use when speed is not as high of a priority like it is in 3D printing. Now, the Zydex uses the closed loop belt configuration for three of its axes, both of the X and the Y. 
I had mentioned that the pulley and the belts need to be of the same specification in order to mesh and operate properly. You can tell all the way over there that this belt and pulley combo does not work. However, this may be less obvious when purchasing them separately on a website like Amazon. Without getting too far into the weeds, there are three specifications that you will need to be on the lookout for when buying timing belt and their matching pulleys. The first is the pitch. The pitch is the distance from the center of one tooth to the next. The second is the tooth profile. Are the teeth trapezoids or semicircles? And the third is the width of the belt. Unfortunately for all of us, timing belt nomenclature is a disaster. So the best way to make sure a belt matches a pulley is to check the three aforementioned specifications for both the belt and the pulley. So if there's such a variety in timing belts that exist, what specification should you go with? Well, for small CNC machines and 3D printers, the GT tooth profile of timing belts is the way to go. Many people mistake the number directly following a GT to be the pitch of the belt. For example, you can purchase a GT2 or a GT3 timing belt. The two and three refer to, to the design iteration of the GT series and not the pitch, as some may think. The GT3 timing belt was released after the GT2 belt and is constructed from a new composite material to increase its load rating. However, pulleys designed for a GT2 belt will mesh perfectly with the GT3 belt and vice versa. I say stick with the GT2 belt because it is cheaper and can always be switched out for GT3 later. Depending on the retailer, the pitch and belt width will either be found in the name or the description. I would say that 95% of 3D printers use a belt width of 5 to 6 millimeters and a pitch of 2 millimeters. Overall, belt driven transmission is cheap, fast, and accurate enough for 3D printing. So why does the Zydex use a lead screw driven transmission for its Z axis? To answer this, let's quickly discuss how this form of transmission works. Usually, a stepper motor is connected to a lead screw through a coupler. As the stepper motor spins the lead screw, a nut block will move up and down the lead screw. This is fairly analogous to the normal mechanism behind a nut and bolt. However, unlike a typical threaded rod found at your local hardware store, the lead screw has special threading to minimize backlash and allow for load transfers without jamming. This is fancy lingo for saying the lead screw can move objects smoothly and accurately. I do want to quickly elaborate on the term backlash because one, it will affect the accuracy of the linear motion, and two, anti-backlash is a common feature when shopping for some of these linear components. Both belt and lead screw systems have backlash or lost motion caused by gaps between the pulley and belt teeth or the lead screw and nut threading. When reversing directions, this lost motion or slack must be taken up before the carriage starts to move. For 3D printing where accuracy and repeatability are important, we should try and minimize the amount of backlash by selecting the correct components. Enter the anti-backlash nut. This nut screws on the lead screw like a typical nut, however a set screw can be installed to apply a preload to the nut by flexing this upper portion. This effectively minimizes the slack or backlash when reversing directions. Trust me, as I tighten down this set screw, this nut will ride on this lead screw much stiffer. You can actually feel that there is less play. If I tell this stepper motor to rotate, you'll notice two things. The first is that the nut block just rotates. It's not moving linearly. The second thing you'll notice is that the lead screw is wobbling. Now we can fix both these things. The first thing is, is that we need to stabilize the nut block. So basically, if we prevent it from rotating, now you can see it's moving up and down. The wobble can be fixed by stabilizing both ends of the lead screw. It's kind of hard for me to do it with my hands. I'm not gonna walk you through how this setup accomplishes what my hands just did. So first off, the nut block is attached to the carriage. The carriage has wheels that are riding along in the inside of the track, and they're actually gonna be resisting uh, the nut block's tendency to rotate. At the end of the lead screw, there are bearings, and these bearings stabilize and prevent that wobbling. My demo here uses a four start Acme lead screw with a pitch of two millimeters and a lead of eight millimeters. I feel like I've already bored you guys with belt specifications, so I'm not gonna break down these dimensions. I would say that it is better for beginners to purchase a set that includes both the nut and the lead screw to ensure compatibility. Nine out of 10 times, if you search 3D printer lead screw on Google, you will end up with the same one that I have. Overall, lead screw based transmissions are more accurate than belts, but are slower and more expensive. 
However, the increased accuracy is not the main reason Acme lead screws are commonly seen on the Z-axis of 3D printers. Acme lead screws are unlikely to spin on their own, which means when we cut the power to the printer, the carriage is not going to drop to the bottom. Here I've set up a demonstration showing that this won't hold true for a belt configuration. I've added a little bit of weight to the carriage and I've unplugged the motor. If I turn it sideways to simulate a Z-axis, you'll see that the carriage drops. Worst case scenario, uh, your hot end crashes into your print. I've unplugged the stepper motor and added the weights to the lead screw setup. As you can see, nothing's moving, but obviously this isn't an apples to apples comparison. You guys already know that this carriage has eight wheels, so more friction. However, you have to believe me that the lead screw is providing a majority of the stability and preventing this carriage from dropping when the power is cut to the motor. The astute will notice that the Z-axis motors do not directly drive the Z-axis lead screw. Instead, the motor drives a smaller pulley, which in turn drives a larger pulley. This pulley configuration will actually increase the resolution at which the Z-axis moves. This makes sense because one turn of the motor shaft and hence the smaller pulley will result in only a partial turn of the larger pulley that is connected to the Z-axis lead screw. This configuration will lead to increased torque but at a cost of lower speed. How do we calculate the speed at which the lead screw rotates compared to the motor shaft's rotation? Great question. For this calculation, we need the gear ratio. This is determined by dividing the number of teeth on the driven pulley, which is the larger pulley in this example, by the number of teeth on the driver pulley, which is the smaller one that is connected to the shaft of the motor. Because the larger pulley has 60 teeth and the smaller one has 16 teeth, the gear ratio would be 3.75. This ratio means that the smaller driver gear must turn 3.75 turns to get this larger driven gear to make one complete rotation. Therefore, the lead screw will always turn 3.75 times slower than the speed of the stepper motor. The opposite would be true if the pulley sizes were reversed. The main purpose of this configuration is not to mess around with the resolution, but instead to relocate the stepper motor from the top to the side. This makes an overall lower profile 3D printer. It should be noted that most 3D printers don't have this drive chain. The only pulley you typically have to worry about is the driver pulley in the closed loop belt configuration. This pulley usually has 16 or 20 teeth. Let me reintroduce the demo before we discuss the optimal teeth the driver pulley should have. As promised, we're gonna discuss why the plate that is attached to the lead screw covers significantly less distance compared to the two belt configurations even when the motors are programmed to rotate the same number of times. I have programmed the motor to complete one revolution. Let's see how far it goes. My indicator says the plate moved about eight millimeters. I know I said I wasn't gonna go into details on the lead screw dimensions, but remember when I said this demo uses a four start Acme lead screw with a pitch of two millimeters and a lead of eight millimeters? Well, the lead of a screw is the linear distance traveled for each complete revolution of the screw. So eight millimeters checks out. Now let's repeat the same measurement for the belt configuration. I'm gonna use my calipers because the distance traveled is gonna to be too far for my indicator to measure. I have made a little black mark here as the starting point for our measurement. The pulley over here has 16 teeth. I will have the motor perform one rotation and then we'll see how this distance compares uh, to the lead screw configuration. As you may or may not be able to see, this is 32 millimeters. Does this 32 millimeters in movement make sense for the one revolution of the pulley? Well, this calculation is actually pretty easy. If you recall, we're using a GT2 timing belt with a pitch of two millimeters because the pulley will match the tooth profile of the timing belt, all you have to do is multiply 16 teeth by two millimeters to determine the circumference of the inside portion of the pulley that will mesh with the belt. So 16 times two is 32. Again, the math checks out. So let's switch out this 16 tooth pulley for a 20 tooth pulley. How far do you think one revolution of the 20 tooth pulley will move the carriage? If you guess 40 millimeters, then you are picking up what I'm laying down. By increasing the tooth count by just four, from 16 teeth to 20 teeth, the carriage will move 20% farther. 
which also means the carriage moved 20% faster because the motor rotated at the same speed for both pulleys. The math checks out, but I still think it is very interesting how only a couple of teeth can have such an impact on speed. Now what is the trade-off for speed? If you know this, then we're really on the same page. It's resolution. The more teeth, the more the resolution decreases. Now it's important to select a pulley that will optimize the performance of your 3D printer. However, it really isn't that big of a deal to use a pulley with 20 teeth instead of a pulley with 16 teeth. The difference in resolution is only a couple of microns. What is important is to know how the rotation of the motor translates to the distance moved by the carriage in millimeters. This conversion from rotation to linear movement will be needed when configuring the 3D printer. Installing a pulley with 20 teeth and thinking it is a pulley with 16 teeth could result in your prints being off in dimension by 20%. Let's discuss the stepper motor and then we can finally start assembling this printer. If the eccentric nuts are the magic sauce, then the stepper motors are the chicken nuggets. The accuracy and reliability of a stepper motor at such a low cost has facilitated the widespread availability of 3D printers and really any low cost CNC machine. Further, the operating principle behind an open loop stepper motor is simpler than the alternatives. Discussing how a stepper motor works and all the criteria that goes into picking one out is going to give us plenty to do in this section. We will discuss wiring and programming the stepper motors a little bit later on. Fortunately, the NEMA stepper motor standard has made it much easier to find and purchase motors that will fit your printer's design. Searching stepper motor on Amazon will return many silver and black stepper motors that have NEMA in the title followed by a number. That number refers to the faceplate size of the stepper motor. For example, a NEMA 17 motor will have a faceplate approximately 1.7 inches by 1.7 inches. Equally as important, all NEMA 17 motors will have the same layout of mounting holes, which means that you can virtually swap out any two stepper motors that fall within the same NEMA. What isn't specified by this standard is the depth or length of the stepper motor, or if the shaft is geared. Here I have two NEMA 23 stepper motors. This one is much longer than this one. We're going to take both of them apart and see what's accounting for this difference in length. But first, a quick stepper motor introduction. A stepper motor differs from a DC motor that is found in drills and fans. Of the many differences, the one that stands out in the context of CNC machines is that if I supply power to the DC motor, I have no idea how many times it rotated between when I switched it on and when I switched it off. If you're watching this video sequentially, then you will know that in the transmission section, I made a big deal about knowing how far the carriage moved for each rotation of the motor shaft. This important conversion from rotational to linear distance would be meaningless if we can't precisely control the motor shaft. There are ways to get rotational feedback from a DC motor. This is usually accomplished by attaching a device known as an encoder to the shaft. I don't have an example in front of me, but I can explain the premise. The encoder and the motor operate in what is known as a closed loop. A microcontroller, such as an Arduino, turns on the motor and checks in with the encoder until the motor has rotated the specified amount. For all intents and purposes, this configuration is expensive and complicated, but is found in premium 3D printers, most of which are not fused filament 3D printers, like the one we're building. Stepper motors, on the other hand, operate in an open loop configuration. Open means that we don't need an external device to check the stepper motor's position. It'll become more clear why this is in a second. When we power up a stepper motor, it doesn't spin freely like a DC motor. It actually takes a coordinated effort by a device known as a stepper driver. The stepper driver sequentially sends varying amounts of current through the four wires of the stepper motor. This orchestrated effort results in the stepping of the motor shaft. If we step the motor fast enough, the shaft will appear to rotate continuously even though the rotation is comprised of discrete steps. A quick peek inside the stepper motor will show us what these wires are supplying current to. As I'm taking apart this stepper motor, I need to fill you in on some lingo. The parts that rotate are collectively called the rotor, while the parts that remain stationary make up the stator. There are a couple different types of stepper motors, but we are focusing on the hybrid stepper motor. This motor combines the designs of permanent magnet stepper motors and variable reluctant stepper motors. The hybrid stepper motors comes in two flavors, a unipolar and bipolar. You can tell the difference between a unipolar and bipolar stepper motor by the lead or wire count. The unipolar has five or more wires, while the bipolar has four wires. Because the stepper motor that we are currently operating on has four wires, it is safe to assume that the bipolar hybrid stepper motor will be the star of this segment. 
I wish I had time to discuss all the different types of stepper motors, but this video is borderline feature film length. The bipolar hybrid stepper motor is the most popular and the most compatible with all 3D printer electronics. So it's a great stepper motor to learn about. What probably jumps out to you first is the bright copper coils of the stator. The wires supply the current, which energizes the copper coils, creating an electromagnetic field. The direction of current flow and how the coils are wound will determine if the coils act as a north or south pole. More formally, this is known as the coil's polarity. As you're probably already aware, four wires is only enough uh, for two independent circuits. With there clearly being more coils than there are wires, some of the coils must be in series or parallel with each other. In fact, every other coil is in the same circuit. The correct terminology here is that every other coil is on the same phase. Now maybe based on the way these wires separate, you would think that the blue and green wires would be part of the same phase and the red and black wires would be part of the same phase. Uh, this is actually not uh, the case. I brought down my multimeter and set it to continuity mode. It'll beep when there's an electrical connection between two conductors, uh, so it should beep if I found two wires that are part of the same phase. If I connect the blue and green wire to my multimeter, there's no beeping. If I connect the blue and red wire, uh, there is beeping. So that means there's continuity and the blue and red wire are on the same phase and by process of elimination, the green and black wire supply the second phase. I always recommend when you buy a stepper motor to check which wires belong to which phase. Uh, you don't actually have to open up the stepper motor to do this, you just need a multimeter. You'd be surprised uh, how the color schemes differ between manufacturers. I am providing all the information here, not for you to memorize, but to emphasize that the way in which a stepper motor is wired and eventually connected to the printer motherboard is important, mostly because of the two separate phases and the direction of current flow and how that will affect the polarity of the coils. We will continue talking about wiring when we actually hook up the motors to the printer motherboard. Next, let's take a closer look at the rotor. Sandwiched between the two bearings on the rotor is a large permanent magnet. The permanent magnet is divided into two sections, the top rotor cup and the bottom rotor cup. These cups have opposite polarities. We'll talk a little bit more about these teeth or grooves that are in the rotor cups. But first, I wanna talk more about the discrete steps taken by the stepper motor before circling back and talking about how the step size uh, is in part dependent on the rotor teeth. The step is the reason why the stepper motor can operate accurately without positional feedback. This is because each step rotates the shaft a precise number of degrees. The most common full step size is 1.8 degrees. Therefore, it would take this motor 200 steps to complete a rotation. To hammer this point home, here is the demo from the transmission section. We still have the 20 tooth pulley installed to the stepper motor. This stepper motor is a 1.8 degree stepper motor. If I told that stepper motor to take 300 full steps, then the shaft would rotate one and a half times. With each complete rotation of the pulley equaling 40 millimeters of belt travel distance, we derive this number in the transmission section, the carriage would move 60 millimeters. If I told the stepper motor to move another 300 full steps, it would move another 60 millimeters. Stepper motor movements are very precise. I have to keep using the word full in front of step because stepper motors can take half steps or operate in even smaller increments known as micro-stepping. Micro-stepping will have its own section because it not only affects accuracy, but also the noise level of 3D printing. So how does the stepper motor move precisely 1.8 degrees per full step? Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to leave you hanging on this question because I'd have to explain even more stepper motor anatomy, most of which isn't critical information for learning how to operate or build a 3D printer. There are, however, a lot of great YouTube videos that address this question, and I will link to them below. What I can quickly show you is that the number of steps it takes for a full rotation is in part dependent on the number of teeth on the rotor. The rotor has 50 teeth and moves a fourth of a tooth pitch per step as the stator phases are energized. Hence, 50 times four equals 200 steps per rotation. And then 360 divided by 200 equals 1.8 degrees. I'm not gonna leave you hanging on why these two NEMA 23 stepper motors have different lengths. Let's go ahead and crack open the big one now and see how it differs from the smaller one that we've already opened up. As you can see, there are way more rotor cups inside the longer NEMA 23 stepper. Similar to the smaller rotor, the cups alternate in polarity. Every two cups is known as a rotor stack. This longer NEMA 23 has four rotor stacks. You also notice that the copper windings travel the whole body of the NEMA 23. 
So the longer bodied NEMA 23 would have longer copper windings. Increasing the length of the stator windings as well as increasing the number of rotor stacks will yield a more powerful uh, stepper motor. Purchasing a longer stepper motor with more than one rotor stack is a great way to get a little bit more oomph or torque uh, out of your stepper motor without having to increase uh, the NEMA size. However, if you require significantly more torque to move your load, then it would be better to increase the frame size of the motor. A NEMA 11 is never gonna have as much torque as a NEMA 23. However, the amount of torque supplied by a NEMA 23 stepper motor is almost always overkill in a normal size 3D printer, but are commonly used in other CNC machines. One of the drawbacks of stepper motors is their power inefficiency. When on, stepper motors consume current independent of the load. Therefore, a resting stepper motor will consume its max current when given the opportunity. That's why it's important to not buy a stepper motor that is too powerful for your application. We actually need the middle ground between the powerful NEMA 23 and the anemic NEMA 11, which happens to be the NEMA 17. For most 3D printers, NEMA 17 motors usually hit the sweet spot between torque and power draw. One thing that might be a little bit confusing is that one stack NEMA 17 stepper motors exist in a variety of torque specifications. Each manufacturer uses a different stack length. You could probably tell from the deconstruction of the NEMA 23 stepper motors that the shorter NEMA 23 had a longer stack length than the longer NEMA 23. Here's another one stack NEMA 17 stepper motor. It's slightly larger than our first and that's because the stack length uh, in this stepper motor is longer. For most 3D printers, you're going to want your NEMA 17 stepper motor to have between 50 to 60 newton centimeters of torque. I had said way back at the beginning of this section that the NEMA standard also does not specify if the shaft is geared or not. Here's a NEMA 17 motor that doesn't have a geared shaft. This is the one we've been working with. And here's one that does. As you can see, the geared shaft adds a bit of housing to the faceplate this means it's difficult to switch out a non-geared stepper motor for a geared stepper motor. So it's best to consider if you need a geared stepper motor in the initial stages of designing your 3D printer. Why might you need one? Well, geared stepper motors usually have increased torque and resolution. Of course, we're gonna take this stepper motor apart to figure out how it works. The first thing you will notice is the arrangement of the gears. These three outside gears orbit around the center gear. Appropriately named, the outside gears are the planetary gears, while the center gear is the sun gear. The planetary gears ride around on the ring gear. The original NEMA 17 shaft is connected to the sun gear, while the new output shaft is coupled to the planetary gears through these spokes. The output shaft will complete one rotation after the planetary gears have gone around the outside ring gear once. Get this. The output shaft has five times more torque than the original NEMA 17 shaft. This is more torque than the one stack NEMA 23. Remember when I made fun of the NEMA 11 and how it will never have more torque than the NEMA 23? Well, that was technically not true. An appropriately geared NEMA 11 stepper motor, such as this one that I found on Amazon, can have more torque than a NEMA 23. But what's the catch? There's always a trade-off. Recall from the transmission section that the gear ratio tells us how many times the input gear must rotate to get one rotation out of the output gear. Without going through the derivation, the gear ratio of a planetary gear arrangement is the number of teeth on the ring, which in our case is 46, divided by the number of teeth on the sun, which again in our case is 11, plus one. Don't forget the plus one. This results in a 5.18 to one gear ratio. The NEMA input shaft will have to rotate 5.18 times in order to get the gearhead shaft to rotate one time. It will now take 1,036 full steps per rotation when using a 1.8 degree stepper as the input for the gear train. From the perspective of the geared output shaft, this stepper motor has a 0.35 degree step size. I hope this makes it clear why gearheads can also increase resolution. However, the looming trade-off with geared stepper motors is speed. In this example, this geared stepper motor would operate at less than one-fifth the speed of its ungeared brother. For this reason, geared stepper motors are rarely seen driving carriages on the axes of 3D printers. But wait, there are two reasons I took the time to explain this. The first is so that you won't accidentally buy geared stepper motors for the linear rails. The second is because geared stepper motors are critical in extruding the filament. You would be surprised by how much force it takes to push filament through the hot end. We will continue this discussion in the extruder section. Okay, that was a lot to talk about for stepper motors. It's time to put everything together that we have learned by building Zydex.
The topics we have covered really apply to most CNC machines. We still need to discuss a couple more 3D printer specific topics, such as the extruder and electronics, so stay tuned until after the build. The moment we've all been waiting for, it's time to assemble Zydex. When you first clicked on this video, you probably didn't think I was going to lecture at you for 30 plus minutes, but we get to apply all the stuff we learned in building the frame and the linear motion of Zydex. We have all the necessary components, rails, pulleys, belts, carriages, uh, brackets for actually attaching the rails together, stepper motors, and yes, we have 3D printed parts to build this 3D printer. It's a common joke that the first step in building a 3D printer is buying a 3D printer. However, these 3D printed parts are necessary in keeping the cost of the printer down. Could you imagine how much it would cost to machine a component like this? It'd be very expensive. If you don't have access to a 3D printer, online 3D printing services do exist. There are many different websites you can upload a printable file to and receive the end product within a week. Also, if you are a student or work at a university, then chances are you already have access to a 3D printer. I recommend building a 3D printer now for when you don't have access to one after you graduate. Finally, we have the tools needed to assemble the printer. As I mentioned way back in the beginning of this video, connecting the rails together is actually really easy. The only thing that can be a little bit of a hassle is if you need to attach something to the end of the rails. Uh, and that's because the ends are not tapped. So one of the tools we need is a tap. Besides that, everything else is pretty standard. We've got Allen keys, we've got wrenches. I'm actually missing a wrench. We've got a tape measurer and calipers for measuring. And the last important tool we have is a square. The square is very important uh, for making sure that the axes are perpendicular to each other. If they're not, the print is not going to look very good. Fortunately, I've already built Zydex once. Uh, during the second build, I can reference back to the first build uh, so that you have an understanding of where each part's going to go. I want to give one more big shout out to the original creator of Zydex, who is Steven. Uh, when I saw this printer a couple months ago, I was like, I've got to build it. The way that he's incorporated uh, dual extrusion setup in such a small compact form factor was just really interesting to me. So interesting, I guess I'm going to build it a second time. I have linked to Steven's original build in the description of this video as well as on my website. However, I've made a lot of my own changes uh, to this printer, so if you want to build my spec, you're going to have to check out my website for a step-by-step -step guide uh, that's going to show you where each piece goes, which bolt to use where, you know, the works. This video is just going to feature a gross overview of building Zydex, and we're really going to focus on, you know, kind of important concepts that apply across all 3D printer builds, especially those that use aluminum extrusion. Our first order of business is to construct this base that wraps around the bottom of Zydex out of these three pieces of aluminum extrusion. The base is what the y-axis rests on and what keeps the z-axis perpendicular. What's kind of a hassle about Zydex's design is that all the linear rails fall between the commercially available 500 millimeters and 250 millimeter lengths linear rail. This means we're gonna have to do some cutting. However, most 3D printer designs don't deviate from the standard lengths, but I guess that's the price we have to pay to be compact. Aluminum extrusion doesn't give much trouble to a hacksaw, but I'm going to button down, so let's automate this process. Oof. I've been trying to expand the metalworking capabilities of my workshop, and I recently acquired this blue jig that turns my porta band into a horizontal bandsaw. This jig is really nice because I can still remove the porta band if I need to be more mobile or if I need to work overhead. Um, anyways, let's stop talking. Let's start cutting. This thing's such a beast, it needs to be chained up. I was on a roll with the bandsaw, so I went ahead and cut all 11 pieces of V-rail to length. To make the base square, we're going to use these brackets to connect the V-rail. As I mentioned before, the holes on the ends of the V-rail are not tapped, so we're going to do that now. I recommend doing this free-handed versus throwing it into a chuck of a drill. Um, you just have to be really careful when you're forming the threads. I've attached the plate to the end of the V-rail with the tapped holes. Now to attach the plate to the length of a V-rail, I have to use a T-nut. To make it a little easier to attach the rails, I typically screw on the T-nut first and then slide the nut through the rail. You now know how to cut the rail, 
tap the rail, and join the rail, both at the ends and along the length. But the most important thing when building a 3D printer is that the rails are perpendicular to each other, at least for the axes. And you would be surprised by how much play there is in both the T-nut and the plates. So to make sure that the rails are actually perpendicular to each other, we need to check it with a square. If you find that your rails are not square, like this example, well then you can loosen the bolts and adjust it until it is square. Now it's time to build the Y-axis. I am using C-beam V-rail to accommodate the larger carriage that will be used for the build platform. A 3D printed component will allow a stepper motor to be attached to the end of the rail. That stepper motor is a standard one stack NEMA 17. A 20 tooth pulley with a GT tooth profile will sit on the shaft of the stepper motor and mesh with the timing belt. One end of the timing belt is attached to the bottom of the carriage, while the other end snakes through a hole in the part that holds the stepper motor, then wraps around the stepper motor pulley, returns back through a lower hole before running across the bottom of the rail. At the end of the rail, this timing belt end is routed around the idler pulley before connecting to the bottom of the carriage to form a closed loop belt configuration. As we talked about in the carriage section, I rotated the two eccentric nuts so the carriage rides snugly on the rail. And that's it. The y-axis is attached to the base after checking that it is square. I cannot emphasize enough how important these right angles are in building a 3D printer. Before we start work on the next axis, I want to talk about a unique feature of Zydex. Not only do the extruders move independently in the x-axis, but they also move independently in the z-axis. Ultimately, this independent z-axis design will allow us to fine-tune the distance between each nozzle and the print bed. Getting this distance right is critical for successful prints, and we will discuss this further in the limit switch section. Next, we're going to build the two x-axes, and then we're going to attach them to the z-carriages, because the clearance becomes tight once we put the z-towers up. The x-axes also use a closed-loop belt configuration, but on a 20x20 20 20 v-rail which means that we will again use a timing belt pulley and idler pulley. What is interesting about the x-axis are the use of bearings to prevent the timing belt from rubbing on the edge of the rail, because as you will see, the timing belt loops behind the V-rail. While all the washers and bearings can be a lot to juggle when attaching the stepper motor, the routing of the belt behind the rail decreased the footprint of the axis, which is perfect for Zydex. It was important to keep the x-axis as light as possible because both z-axis will have to lift an x-axis, hence why we are using the smallest V-rail. I am now attaching a x-axis to a z-carriage through right angle connectors. I made sure that the faces of the two connectors were square to the edge of the z-axis carriage. Therefore, when I place the x-axis on these connectors, the rail will be perpendicular to the z-axis. An interesting design element of this printer is that the extrusion drives will ride on separate rails parallel to the x-axis we just built. So an extra rail needs to be attached to the opposite side of each z-carriage. We will talk more about this design choice when we add the extruders and drives to the frame. It's time to add the rail for the z-axis to the base. Prior to filming this, I attached 3D printer feet in order to prevent vibrational noise during printing, and this additional clearance will give the uh, power supply more airflow because eventually it'll be mounted uh, to the bottom of the base. Attaching the z-rails should be easy because we took the time to get the base square. So if we snug the z-rail up against their respective corners, they should be perpendicular to the y-axis and the build platform. I know that it looks like there are a lot of components here, but a lead screw setup is generally much quicker to put together because you don't have to worry about belt tension. In the transmission section, I explain the reasoning behind why we are using lead screws instead of belts for the Z-axis. Mm -hmm. 
there you have it, the frame is built. I know I sped up some of the clips as I was building, but in real time, the frame only took a couple hours to put together. Because of how easy it is to work with and assemble, I highly recommend using aluminum extrusion for building really any CNC machine. <laughs> With the frame and rails assembled, it's time to discuss the extruder. The extruder is obviously what makes this assembly of linear actuators a 3D printer. You may not know this, but there are many different types of 3D printing technologies. The way in which the extruder heats and liquefies a thermoplastic before depositing it on the build platform is what makes this printer a fused deposition modeling or FDM printer. Just a quick clarification, the term FDM is trademarked by Stratus a large 3D printing company. Due to its trademark, the DIY 3D printer community has rebranded FDM as FFF, or Fused Filament Fabrication. There's no difference between the terms besides the trademark. Looking back, I should have exclusively used the term FFF for this video because I'm appealing to the maker community. But anyways, let's get back on topic by going over the anatomy of an extruder. We will start from the bottom, which is gonna be closest to the build platform, and work our way up the extruder assembly. First, we have the nozzle which has a small pinhole where liquefied filament exits from the extruder. The size of this pinhole is known as the extrusion diameter. The smaller the extrusion diameter, the higher the resolution of the prints. The smallest recommended diameter is about 250 microns. I usually recommend fused filament 3D printers for designs that have a feature size of at least 0.5 millimeters. If you need higher resolution, stereolithography is another 3D printing technology that is quickly becoming affordable for the hobbyist and has great resolution. Nozzles are made out of a variety of different metals such as brass, copper, steel, and tungsten carbide. Get this, there are even gemstone nozzles. I don't need it, but I want it. All of these nozzle types have a different wear resistance. Composite filaments containing hard and sharp particles like carbon fiber and sand will eat away at the inside of the nozzle, affecting the extrusion diameter. I don't usually print with exotic filaments, so I stick with cheap brass nozzles. I recently purchased the gold edition of the E3D V6 extruder because I'm extra, but it comes with a hardened steel nozzle. So now I can experiment with some carbon fiber composites to create stiffer prints. The nozzle screws into the hot end. The hot end is made hot by this ceramic heater cartridge and a thermistor measures the temperature of the hot end and provides regulatory feedback to the microcontroller to make sure that the hot end stays within a set temperature range. If the hot end is below the melting temperature of the filament, then it can't be extruded. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if the hot end is too hot, the molten polymer will either burn or have too low of a viscosity to be properly deposited onto the build platform. The upper portion of the extruder that starts with these aluminum fins is known as the cold end. I define the cold end to be from the fins to the top of the extrusion drive. The extrusion drive is what pinches the filament and forces it through the hot end. Intuitively, the filament has to be cold so that the gears in the extrusion drive can grip the filament. If the filament was soft, then the gears wouldn't be able to gain traction. This is similar to a car's wheels spinning in the mud. The gears that have the splines cut into them and are responsible for grabbing a hold of the filament are known as hob gears. I think technically the gears on my Maker Gear M2 are known as drive gears. The drive gear doesn't have the contours of the filament and just has the sharp teeth. It's important to confine the molten filament to just the hot end. The longer the distance of preheated filament, the more likely the extruder is to jam. For this reason, the cold end is often actively cooled with a fan to prevent heat creep. Heat creep is the spread of heat from the hot end to the cold end, which would result in more molten filament. In some extruder designs, such as the Zydax, which is modeled here, and my Maker Gear M2, the extrusion drive sits on top of the cold end and moves along with it. In other designs, like the Ultimaker, the extrusion drive is fastened to the frame and is connected to the cold end by a long tube known as a Bowden tube. There are pros and cons for both placements of the extrusion drive, but I can boil it down to a pro and con for each. With the Bowden tube extrusion drive system, the print head can accelerate and deaccelerate faster because the print carriage does not have the added weight of the motor. This can significantly speed up print times. The drawback for this setup is the distance between the extrusion drive and the hot end. This longer distance results in the extrusion process being less responsive. For people new to 3D printing, the extruder not only has to eject filament on demand, but it also has to attract filament in order to move to unconnected features or parts on the build platform. 
This hysteresis or lag in the extrusion process is amplified when printing flexible filaments. So it's best to avoid the Bowden setup when you expect to print flexible parts. For the direct extrusion system, the pros and cons are swapped. You can't accelerate and deaccelerate as quickly because the carriage has the added mass of the stepper motor, but the extrusion and retraction of the filament is more responsive. I tend to always employ direct extrusion as the maintenance is minimal. Further, I tend to print at lower speeds anyways because part quality is always my highest priority. We will finish up this section by talking about the extrusion stepper motor. As I mentioned in the stepper motor section, the amount of force required to extrude filament is unexpectedly high. It is best to have a motor that weighs the least, especially for the direct extrusion drive system. Recall from the stepper motor section that we can increase the torque output of a smaller NEMA motor through gearing. The M2 uses nearly the same planetary gearbox setup as we previously covered. The extrusion drive setup in the Zydex is a little different. Inside this black housing is a small gear. This small gear sits on an ungeared pancake NEMA 17. The gear then meshes with a larger gear, and this larger gear turns a hob gear. This results in a 3 to 1 gear reduction or 3 times the torque for this pancake NEMA 17. I should mention that the drawback of reduced speed is not as important in the extrusion process where low motor speeds are used. Before we attach the extruder to the printer, I want to talk about a different type of extruder, a filament extruder. I am definitely running the risk of confusing you because the extruder that we just built uses filament in its extrusion process, but hold on a second, I can explain. These spools of filament start off as plastic pellets. These plastic pellets are extruded into a filament that will be fed into Zydex's hot end. I recently had the opportunity to build and play with a filament extruder, and I wanted to show it off and explain why someone like myself would want to extrude their own filament. The operating principle of a filament extruder is quite simple. A motor turns a screw, which feeds the pellet into a hot end, with a nozzle that has a 1.75 millimeter orifice. The plastic exits the nozzle through this hole where it is cooled by a fan. This process is very similar to what we just discussed with the printer extruder, but this is occurring at a larger scale. It's very important that the filament has a constant 1.75 millimeter diameter as it exits the extruder. Any deviation will result in the 3D printer getting clogged if the diameter is too large, or under extruding if the diameter is too small. If you've ever purchased filament before, then you may have noticed that filament not only comes in a 1.75 millimeter diameter, but also a three millimeter diameter. 3D printer extruders are not compatible with both diameters. The one we just assembled accepts a 1.75 millimeter filament. It's important to match your filament diameter to your printer's extruder. I always recommend a 1.75 millimeter filament purely because this is more common. Filament is very cheap. So why would someone want to spend their time extruding their own filament? In my opinion, the most appealing aspect of owning a filament extruder is the ability to make bespoke filaments. That sounded fancy, didn't it? But seriously, the types of filament that can be made are endless. I can create custom colors by adding different amounts of colorants, or I can throw in some metal or ceramic powder to achieve some really cool effects. The other benefit of owning a filament extruder is being able to turn failed 3D prints back into filament. I just built this extruder last night, so I have not had much time to experiment with it, but let me know if a standalone video on filament extrusion is of interest to you. Sorry for going off on a tangent there, let's get back on topic. Now it's time to attach the extruders and drivers to the frame. Most DIY and inexpensive commercial 3D printers, including Zydex, use plastic components to hold on to the cold end of the extruder. In my opinion, this is not the safest practice because most plastics, especially those that can be 3D printed, have a low glass transition temperature. This is the temperature at which the plastic starts to go from a hard material to a soft and rubbery one. Basically, if the cold end fan ever stopped working, there is a chance that the cold end could reach a high enough temperature that the plastic holding the extruder could flex. Worst case scenario, the extruder slips out of its holder and lands on something flammable. To be safe, you should choose a plastic with the highest glass transition temperature as possible or avoid designs that use this setup. There are two other things we need to discuss, the part cooling fan and why the extrusion drive sits on a separate rail from the extruder. Let's start with the part cooling fan. To put it simply, some plastics print better if they are cooled quickly after being deposited by the nozzle. One way to increase the cooling rate is to blow air over the layers that are being printed with an optional fan known as a part cooling fan. Zydex has two part cooling fans, one for each extruder, and these fans are controlled by the printer software and can be switched on and off based on the plastic. It's definitely not a bad idea to add a part cooling fan to your build. 
Next, let's talk about why the extrusion drive for each extruder rides on a separate rail. The speed at which a stepper motor can accelerate the extruder's carriage is based on how much that carriage weighs and how much torque the stepper motor possesses. Because the extrusion drive is connected to the extruder via a Bowden tube, there's a small amount of movement the extruder can do without having to pull along the extrusion drive carriage because of the flex in the Bowden tube. Stepper motors have access to their maximum amount of torque after they're already moving, so in theory, a stepper motor should have an easier time accelerating the extruder and then accelerating the extrusion drive. But this could be negligible. Either way, it makes the printer look cool and it works well in my experience. With the two extruders installed, this guy is starting to look like a 3D printer. In the next section, we're gonna go over the build platform. <laughs> As the filament is pushed through the nozzle by the extrusion drive, it needs a place to be deposited. Enter the build platform, which is also known as the print bed. The maximum part size that can be printed will be limited by the size of this platform. However, it is possible to install a build platform that is too large because the range of the extruder is gonna be dependent on the length of its linear axis that it sits on. Now, Zydex's build platform is undeniably small, and this was perhaps the only reason that I was considering building a different printer for this video. But this offers us a great opportunity to talk about what the optimal print bed size is. When people first start 3D printing, the initial instinct is to print larger and larger parts. However, fused filament 3D printers are limited by how quickly they can deposit material onto the build platform. The extruder is the main limiting factor. Some extruders like the E3D Volcano are able to pump out massive amounts of plastic, which allows large prints to be completed quickly. The trade-off for these fast prints is resolution. The Volcano extruder is not capable of the small details that Zydex's V6 extruder is. Therefore, the optimal size of the print bed should be decided in the design phase based off the dimensions of the parts you expect to print. This decision will also influence the extruder choice. For the V6 and many other extruders, I find a printable area ranging from 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters to 300 millimeters by 300 millimeters to hit the sweet spot for allowing sufficiently large parts to be printed within a reasonable amount of time. As I alluded to during the frame build, the reason that I built Zydex, small bed and all, is because I wanted a full feature 3D printer that was small enough to be transported to the 3D printing classes that I teach or local maker fairs. Anyways, let's get back on topic. This section is called heated bed. So where does the heat come in? Let's take a closer look at how the filament cools after exiting the extruder. As the molten filament is deposited on the build platform, the edges of the print will cool faster than the center of the part. This uneven cooling causes uneven contractions in the part, which manifest in the corners lifting off the bed platform. This is called warping and is not only undesirable aesthetically, but also is unwanted because it can affect the dimensions of the 3D printed part. To combat warping, most 3D printers have a heated bed platform to maintain a constant temperature throughout the part as it cools. Heating the build platform to 60 degrees Celsius will prevent warping when printing many different plastics. While technically a heated bed is not required, I would not build a printer without one because they are relatively inexpensive and the benefits far outweigh the cost. I am currently soldering wires to the heated bed in order to supply it power. I am also using thermal glue to adhere a thermistor to the bottom of the build so that the printer can monitor the bed's temperature. You can purchase heated beds that come fully wired, so don't worry, owning a soldering iron is not a requirement for building a 3D printer, although it is very useful. The heated plate sits on a 3D printed part. This part is made out of peak, which has a high glass transition temperature and superb thermal resistance. Now you can't print directly on the heated bed, which is usually a PCB heater. A flat plate is put on top of the heater 
I always use a glass plate, so will Zydex. I then cover this glass plate with hairspray, captain's tape, or a combination of the two to help the first layer of filament adhere to the print bed. Rarely do I have adhesion issues with this setup. However, there are many other ways to successfully prep the build surface to allow for proper part adhesion, but I don't have that much experience with them. Obviously, you don't want the glass rattling around while you're printing, so I'm gonna show you how I make sure it stays put. As you may know, 3D printers are not so good at producing threaded holes. But with an old soldering iron, I can sink these threaded inserts into 3D printed parts, which then act as a tapped hole. I can then easily attach other parts, like these small pieces that will push up against the side of the glass plate, holding it in place. Well, that wraps up the print bed section. Next up, we're gonna talk about how the printer uses limit switches to determine the location of the extruder in relationship to the build platform. <laughs> The 3D printer needs a reference location, known as a home, to base all of its subsequent movements on. To define a home location, it's important to start visualizing the linear rails of this 3D printer as axes of a 3D graph, with each axis having a positive direction ending in a maximum and a negative direction ending in a minimum. For simplicity, let's say this home location is at the minima of the X, Y, and Z axes, or 0, 0, 0. When the power is turned on, how does the printer find these minima? This process is known as homing and can be accomplished by placing a sensor on each axis, which are triggered when the carriage reaches the minima. These sensors are known as limit switches or end stops. Limit switches are characterized by how they are triggered. Zydex uses mechanical limit switches, which are triggered when bumped. There are three other types of limit switches that we're going to discuss. Optical, magnetic, and resistive. The mechanical limit switch is the most commonly used because of its simplicity and low cost. It is fundamentally just a push button with a special metal spring arm. When pressed, the switch will either open or close a circuit, depending on how it's wired. When placed at the minimum on the axis, the carriage will bump into the limit switch. The microcontroller will sense a change in the state of the switch and will stop stepping the motor. Optical limit switches consist of an LED and a phototransistor. When the light path between the LED and phototransistor is blocked, the base current of the phototransistor decreases. Most optical switches translate these changes in phototransistor currents to a digital high or low signal based on if an obstruction is present, making this limit switch type compatible with many 3D printer motherboards. However, unlike the mechanical switch, the optical switch requires an extra wire that supplies power for the LED. With optical limit switches, the detection of the carriage is a contactless process. You don't have to worry about parts fatiguing or wearing out over time, like the spring arm of the mechanical switch. Magnetic limit switches operate on either the principle of electromagnetic induction or the Hall effect. I'm going to demo a Hall effect switch, but it's a good idea to read up on both sensor types if you choose one or the other for your limit switches. Similar to the optical limit switch, Hall-based switches are contactless, but instead of detecting changes in light, they measure changes in magnetic fields. This is why there is a magnet attached to the carriage in the demo. As the carriage moves the magnet closer to the minimum, and hence the Hall sensor, there will be a distance at which an output signal is triggered. This is about four millimeters in our example. Similar to the optical sensor, the Hall sensor needs an extra wire, but in this case, it's for a reference voltage, which is required for the switching effect. Unlike an optical sensor, the Hall sensor is not affected by ambient light. The final type of limit switches that we're gonna discuss is resistive. Force sensitive resistors, as their name implies, change resistance when experiencing force. Here I'm compressing the sensor and its change in resistance is detected by a small controller, right here, that relays a logic level signal to the main printer motherboard. You can see that when I press on the sensor, the LED on the board turns red. Similar to the mechanical limit switch, the carriage has to touch the force sensitive resistor for it to be detected. Very rarely is this type of limit switch used to home carriages, but it is used for probing the Z-axis. We will discuss the difference between probing and homing the Z-axis in a second. Of the first three sensor types, mechanical, optical, and magnetic, which type should you choose to home each carriage to the axis minima? Objectively, the magnetic Hall effect limit switch is probably the best choice. It is highly precise and resistant to noise. 
However, these benefits come at a slight cost increase, but across the board, most limit switches are relatively inexpensive. Personally, I always opt for mechanical end stops. They are low profile, simple, and natively compatible with every 3D printer motherboard. Let's wire up some of the mechanical limit switches for Zydex. Each limit switch has three terminals. They're either labeled C for common, NC for normally closed, or NO for normally open. Of the two wires needed, one is dedicated to the common terminal to supply power to the switch. Based on whether or not the micro switch is pressed will determine which terminal the common is connected to. Can you guess which terminal this would be if the switch is unpressed? We can check with the multimeter. Again, using continuity mode, connecting one lead to the common pin, we can probe the other two pins. We see that unpressed, the common line is connected to the normally closed. If we press the switch, the multimeter no longer beeps, so the common no longer has a connection to the normally closed terminal. The printer motherboard will sense this open circuit to determine that the carriage has triggered the limit switch. So when the switch is pressed, by process of elimination, the common line must be connected to the normally open. I always wire my limit switches in a normally closed configuration so that the motherboard senses a disruption in the circuit. This way, if a wire becomes disconnected from the limit switch, the motherboard will stop the carriage, while this would not be true for a limit switch wired in a normally open configuration. If you noticed, Zydex does not have a limit switch for the Z-axis. Instead, this printer has a force-sensitive Z-probe, which I'm now going to elaborate on. The most important distance in 3D printing is the distance between the extruder nozzle and the print bed at the start of the print. If this distance is too great, then the molten filament will not adhere to the print bed, resulting in a failed print. If this distance is too small, then the pressure in the nozzle will build up because there is not enough clearance for the filament to be extruded, which could also jam the extruder, resulting in a failed print. In the same way that we found the minima of the axes with limit switches, we can find the height of the print bed by triggering a force-sensitive resistor that is either underneath the bill plate or above the bill plate at a precisely known distance. The extruder is then brought down to touch either the bill plate or the force-sensitive resistor directly. This process is called probing, and the force-sensitive resistor would be called the Z-probe. There are different probe types, just like there are different limit switches. A Z-probe is not absolutely necessary, but it can be used in addition to or in place of a Z-limit switch. It's time to discuss the puppet master for all these components, the printer motherboard, or as the cool kids call it, the MOBO. <laughs> All the electrical components will be connected to the printer motherboard, which houses the microcontroller. It's the microcontroller's job to enact the code from the 3D printer software to ultimately produce a 3D printed object. This job includes not only barking orders like telling the stepper drivers when and in what direction to move the motors, but also requires the microcontroller to listen and respond to various inputs like the extruder temperature or the state of the limit switches. It's the motherboard's responsibility to provide the physical connections for these electrical components. The number of stepper motors, heaters, sensors, and buttons that the motherboard can support is often a deciding factor when choosing a motherboard. For example, Zydex has seven stepper motors, all of which have to be driven independently. Very few motherboards have seven or more stepper drivers. Let's walk through some of the motherboards that I have here to continue our talk on motherboard connectivity. Please keep in mind that this is a very small sample size of all the different boards that do exist. First off, we have ramps. Now, RAMPS is really just an Arduino Mega shield, which allows an Arduino Mega to control 3D printer components that operate at greater than five volts. This board allows for up to five stepper motors to be attached and controlled independently. The five stepper motors are connected here, 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 and here. Wires supplying current to the heating element are attached here. This includes the heated bed, 
and up to two extruders. And limit switches, as we had just discussed, are attached to these banks of pens. And the thermistors, which regulate the temperature of the extruders and heated bed, are attached to these pens. This is already turning into a little bit of a mess, but don't worry, we're gonna talk about wiring uh, in more detail in its own dedicated section. For $30 or less, you can have the Arduino Mega, Ramp Shield, as well as five stepper drivers. However, its low cost means that it is missing some key features, such as a part cooling fan header, an LCD header, and any kind of fail safes for improper wiring. Next up, we have the MKS board, which is really just a Ramps and Arduino Mega incorporated on a single board. However, this motherboard does have a dedicated part cooling fan terminal and LCD pin header. This board comes in at the same price as the Ramps plus Arduino Mega, so having a little more connectivity at the same price means the MKS board is the way to go on a budget. The third motherboard is called Rambo, and while it looks similar to the MKS board, it's roughly five times the price. What is accounting for this price difference? Well, quality and reliability. While Rambo still uses the same Arduino processor as the previous two boards, the board design and components are superior to that of the previous two boards we discussed. A couple examples of this superiority are the use of real fuses for each voltage rail, and the ability to tune the motor current digitally. A couple of years ago, Rambo was the go-to motherboard for high-end 3D printers, but today, the high-end motherboard market is packed with competitors. Our fourth and final board is one such competitor. But before we talk about the last board, I want to talk about motherboard firmware. Simply put, the firmware is the code that bridges the software that generates 3D printer files and the hardware that makes these files a reality. When you purchase a motherboard, you're buying into one of the 10 plus firmwares that exist. While all firmwares readily support the most common types of fused filament 3D printer designs, there are subtle differences between firmwares which can make more complicated 3D printers like Zydex difficult or impossible to set up. Keep in mind that Zydex is an extreme example with its two independent Z axes and X axes. Printer compatibility can be easily checked on the firmware's documentation. When building your own 3D printer, you will have to edit the firmware with your printer specific values. For example, in the transmission section, I showed you how to determine the distance the carriage moves per rotation of the stepper motor. This value and others will be inputted into the firmware. Some firmwares are easier to edit than others. The first three boards share the same firmware known as Marlin. Marlin is feature rich and its widespread use makes it easy to get help on forms during setup. I have used Marlin for years. My 3D food printer and 3D printed 3D printer both used ramps running Marlin. The only negative side of Marlin is that it has so many features that it can be difficult for newcomers to navigate. Now the fourth motherboard known as the Do It To Wi-Fi uses a different type of firmware known as RepRap firmware, which is perhaps one of the best parts about the Duet. We will come back to that. Let's do a quick overview of this board. First impressions, the Duet looks a lot more powerful than the three previous boards, partially because of its large 32-bit processor and its beefy stepper drivers. Look at the size of the Duet stepper drivers compared to the stepper drivers of the Rambo. Let's talk a little bit more about the Duet's microcontroller. Compared to the 8-bit microcontrollers of the previous three boards, the Duet's 32-bit processor can perform quicker calculations, allowing for better stepper motor performance at high speeds. Plus, it can control up to 10 stepper motors if you have the expansion board. This is the main board. This is the expansion board. They're joined together by a ribbon cable. Zydex uses the Duet plus expansion board because it needs seven stepper drivers. There are a lot of other really cool features to the Duet, but the final one I want to touch on in this section is the web interface made possible by the RepRap firmware. While other 3D printer web interfaces exist, the Duet's is the cleanest and the only one where the firmware can be accessed via the web interface. Being able to edit printer parameters such as step motor speeds and extruder offsets on the fly is a godsend for people building and calibrating 3D printers. Of course, there's always a cost for greatness, and the Duet plus the expansion card is one of the most expensive motherboards for 3D printing. It's impossible for me to recommend one motherboard because every printer and user is gonna have different needs. For a simple single extruder Cartesian 3D printer, a cheap MKS board would work just fine. But maybe you can justify purchasing an expensive Duet Wi-Fi after reviewing all the features. In the next section, we're gonna discuss stepper drivers. When the stepper drivers are soldered in the motherboard, like in the case of the Duet, or in the case of Rambo, they too can be a deciding factor in which motherboard you choose.
The stepper driver converts digital signal from the microcontroller into stepper motor rotation by sending variable amounts of current to the stator phases. Let's walk through this entire sequence of events that end in the stepper motor moving to emphasize the importance of the stepper driver. First, a program known as a slicer converts a digital file to be 3D printed into three-dimensional coordinates known as G-code. It should be noted that this G-code also contains other important information for the printer, such as extruder temperatures and fan speeds. The microcontroller on the 3D printer motherboard, represented here by the Arduino, reads this G-code and its interpretation of the code is based off its firmware. When the microcontroller reads a G-code coordinate, it checks the location of the extruder and determines which stepper motors need to be moved in order to get the extruder to the desired location. The microcontroller also relays the direction that the driver needs to move the motor, either clockwise or counterclockwise. From these signal inputs, the stepper driver changes the magnetic fields of the phases to rotate the motor shaft. As an example, I've gone ahead and wired up a stepper driver to an Arduino, which will send the step and direction signals. It looks a little complicated, but the most important wires are those connected to the step and direction inputs on the stepper driver, which are the yellow and orange wires respectively. The other wires are two separate power connections, 24 volts for the stepper motor and five volts for the stepper driver logic. Don't worry, you won't ever have to wire up a stepper driver like I'm doing to the microcontroller if you buy any mainstream motherboard. However, you will have to connect the stepper motor to the driver phase pins. In the motherboard section, I briefly showed you guys where those phase pins were located at on the ramps board. There are two phases and two wires per phase, hence four pins. Here, the red and blue wires power one phase and the green and black wires power the other. The motor will work as long as the wires that are on the same phase are plugged in next to each other. Even with this requirement, there are still more than a couple of configurations that the phase wires can be connected. Like this, or this. Let's do some experimentation to see what happens for each case. Now I could have done this experiment on the ramps board that I was just holding, but I would have to plug in a couple more 3D printer components to make sure that the board didn't throw an error. So it's easier for me to showcase the differences in stepper motor wiring with this Arduino setup that I have here. Again, the red and blue wires which share the same phase are plugged in next to each other, and the green and black wires that share the same phase are plugged in next to each other. I created a small Arduino program to tell the stepper driver to rotate the shaft one full rotation. In this configuration, the stepper motor shaft rotated uh, counterclockwise. Let's swap the two sets of phase wires and see if that has any effect on the direction of movement. Interesting, we got clockwise rotation there. Let's swap the two wires within a single phase. We're now back to that counterclockwise rotation. Let's swap the wires in the other phase. That caused the shaft to turn clockwise. So what have we learned here? Well, if the two wires that belong to the same phase are next to each other, then all is good. The stepper motor is going to work. We also learned that the direction the motor rotates is dependent on the order of the phases and the order of the wires that supply the power to the phases. Every time I swapped the wire, I was reversing the current in one of the two phases. The stepper driver contains electrical components that allow it to change the direction of current flowing through the phases, which is how it changes the direction the motor rotates after receiving a new signal from the direction pin. When you first get your 3D printer up and running, if the carriage is moving in the wrong direction, you can either swap two of the wires as I have done, or a small adjustment in the firmware can be made. Now, the stepper driver needs to be sized correctly to the motor that it is going to control. This larger stepper driver can power either the smaller NEMA 17 or the large NEMA 23. However, this small stepper driver cannot offer up enough current for this large NEMA 23 to operate properly without the driver burning up. Fortunately, because one stack NEMA 17 stepper motors are almost universally used for 3D printers, most motherboard manufacturers pre-install drivers capable of controlling such stepper motors. This way, the end user doesn't have to worry about selecting an appropriate stepper driver. However, issues arise when these 3D printer motherboards are adapted for larger applications like CNC machining, which uses larger stepper motors. The stepper driver from our examples has been the A4988, which is an extremely common and cheap driver. All of the previously discussed motherboards, except for the Duet, use this driver.
The Duet, on the other hand, uses Trinamic TMC2660 drivers. These drivers are magical, and I need to be careful not to geek out too much about them on camera. One awesome feature of this driver is its ability to detect when the motor stalls. On Zydex, I can block the movement of its Y-axis, and a warning will pop up in the web interface that an obstacle has been detected. This stall detection will prevent the carriage from getting abused if, say, I left a screwdriver on the rail. The other awesome feature that I wanted to talk about is how quiet and smooth the Trinamic drivers step the motor compared to the A4988 drivers. In addition to my A4988 example, I've also wired a Trinamic stepper driver to a microcontroller and stepper motor. We should be able to tell the difference just by listening. Here is the A4988 in action. And here is the Trinamic driver. The noise profile of the Trinamic controlled stepper motor is not only quieter, but also smoother. In our next section on microstepping, we will first define this term and then talk about how the Trinamic stepper drivers use microstepping interpolation to achieve this smooth and seemingly vibration free movement. The final stepper motor topic is upon us it's microstepping. Let's first review the step size of a stepper motor. A complete 360 degree rotation of the stepper motor shaft is comprised of discrete steps. The most common step size is 1.8 degrees. As I briefly showed in the stepper motor section, this 1.8 degrees is a product of there being 50 teeth on the stepper motor's rotor. A stepper motor with 100 rotor teeth would have half the step size. However, there are ways to get smaller step size without increasing the rotor teeth count. Maybe you are wondering why a smaller step size would be advantageous for 3D printing. Higher resolution is a fairly obvious benefit from decreasing the step size, but let's talk about why a 1.8 degree step size is too large to produce quality 3D printed parts. The timing belt on Zydex's Y axis is driven by a 20 tooth pulley. Recall from the transmission section that the 20 tooth pulley would move the belt 40 millimeters per rotation. The smallest distance that the Y carriage can be moved with a 1.8 degree stepper motor operating at its full step size is going to be 40 divided by 200, which is 0.2 millimeters or 200 microns. While this sounds like a small distance, it is not sufficient to print some geometries. For example, a Cartesian 3D printer like Zydex has to approximate curves with small stairs. If these stairs are sufficiently small, then the curve will look and feel smooth, but at a resolution of 200 microns, you would be able to feel and see the stairs. It's difficult for me to say at exactly what resolution these stairs would appear smooth, but generally 50 microns or less is best. The other benefit of decreasing the step size is less obvious and does not improve print quality, but it is important nonetheless. When the separate motor shaft takes a step, the rotor does not lurch forward one step and then immediately stop. The rotor will overshoot the step size before being drawn back in the opposite direction. This is known as overshoot or ringing and will occur multiple times before the rotor comes to a rest. These oscillations generate noise and vibrations, especially when the stepper motor is operating at large step sizes and low speeds. Therefore, stepper motors that take smaller steps produce less noise. Let's compare the noise level of a stepper motor operating at a 1.8 degree or full step size and another operating at 0.1125 degrees or a micro step size. The stepper motor that is microstepping has 3200 steps per rotation compared to the first stepper's 200 steps. I have both motors programmed to rotate at the same speed. Listen closely to the difference in loudness between the motors. Clearly the first stepper motor is louder. You have to keep in mind that during printing, it is common to have three stepper motors moving at one time. The x-axis stepper, the y-axis stepper, and the extrusion drive stepper. So really you have to multiply this noise level by three. The full step and micro stepping motors are identical. The difference is that the stepper driver for the micro stepping motor is set to a 1 16th micro stepping mode. This mode takes one full step and divides it up into 16 micro steps. Hence the 3200 steps comes from 16 times 200 full steps. Instead of switching the phases on and off, the driver gradually transfers current between phases which allows for these smaller step sizes. 
Even smaller microstepping increments do exist, such as dividing one full step into 64 or even 128 microsteps. But there are diminishing returns for using smaller and smaller microsteps because while resolution increases with decreasing step size, the motor's accuracy remains unchanged. There are also other issues when employing really small microsteps, such as the lack of incremental torque between microsteps and the need for the microcontroller to have higher processing power to generate faster step pulses. Microstepping really is a fascinating topic I highly recommend clicking on some of the links that I have provided. The last couple of things that I want to talk about in this section are how to enable microstepping, what microstepping means for our steps per millimeter conversion, and the microstepping interpolation of the trinamic stepper driver. The way in which microstepping is enabled will depend on the drivers and the motherboard. First and most importantly, make sure your motherboard and stepper drivers support microstepping. The most common method to enable microstepping is through rearranging these jumpers. The motherboard's documentation will show which jumpers need to be connected for 1 16th microstepping mode, which is the microstep size that I recommend. Some motherboards allow for microstepping increments to be digitally set via the firmware. When we enable microstepping, how does this affect our steps per millimeter? Well, the steps per millimeter will be scaled by the number of microsteps per full step. For the 20 tooth pulley, it was 200 steps per 40 millimeters, or 5 full steps per millimeter. If 1 16th microstepping mode is enabled, we have electronically segmented one step into 16, so we'll now take 5 times 16 or 80 steps for the stepper motor shaft to move the belt one millimeter. This section became longer than I had intended, but hey, it was time well spent because this is an important topic. I'm going to quickly finish by talking about microstepping interpolation that the trinamic stepper driver used in the stepper driver section to operate so quietly compared to the A4988, which does not have this feature. Both stepper drivers were configured in 1 16th microstepping mode and received 3200 step pulses per rotation from the microcontroller. But the trinamic stepper driver broke down the 1 16th steps into 1 256th steps. Now this may be a little bit confusing because I had previously said that there were little benefits to these small microsteps. However, the trinamic stepper driver is performing this interpolation not for the purpose of increasing resolution, but to allow for smoother operation of the stepper motor. Plus, these calculations are done on board the stepper driver, so this microstepping interpolation is not any more intensive than 1 16th microstepping for the microcontroller. I hope I didn't confuse you too much at the end of this section. It's now time to talk about power supplies. 3D printers don't run off wishful thinking. The motherboard cannot be connected directly to an AC outlet for power. It requires a low DC voltage, either 12 volts or 24 volts, depending on the motherboard and 3D printer components. A regulated DC power supply unit will step down and rectify the AC voltage from the wall to supply a constant DC current. Most DC power supplies are metal boxes with a row of screw terminals. Three of the screw terminals take in the AC power lines, while the other terminals are the positive and negative outputs for a single DC voltage. Using a 24 volt power supply is generally recommended over a 12 volt power supply. 24 volts will increase the performance of the stepper motors at high speeds, and lighter wires can be used as the heated bed will require less current at higher voltages. Whether you choose a 12 or 24 volt power supply, it is necessary to make sure that your extruder and heated bed are compatible. Extruders are either sold as a 12 volt or 24 volt addition. The heated bed can usually accept both voltages, but where the wires are connected will depend on the voltage supplied. After deciding on a voltage, the last consideration for the power supply is the output current. The output current times the voltage will equal the power supply's wattage. The higher the wattage, the more expensive and larger the power supply will be. The wattage of your power supply will depend on how your printer is configured. Stepper motors, extruders, fans, and LEDs will all draw power. The wattage of each component can be found on the manufacturer's data sheet, but a general rule of thumb is to allot 100 watts for all electrical components in a single extruder setup, except for the heated bed. The heated bed is a power-hungry component. Zydex's little heated bed requires 100 watts on its own. To determine the wattage needed for Zydex, I treated it as two single extruder printers, which would be 200 watts, and I added the 100 watts from the print bed. So my 350 watt power supply is perfect. The last thing I'll say about power supplies is to buy one from a reputable company. Poorly manufactured power supplies could fry your printer motherboard. I find the manufacturer mean well to supply quality power supplies on a budget. The power supply will be mounted underneath the Y-axis. 
it will be mounted with, of course, another 3D printed part. If you remember from when we were building the frame, I attached these feet to give the power supply more clearance because the fan's on the bottom. Now might also be a good time to mention that I don't have the LCD on this second printer. The Duet web interface was too good. I never really used the LCD on the first printer. That wraps up the power supply section. We're finally going to deal with this mess of wires. <laughs> Before we can connect the electrical components to the printer motherboard, we need to organize all these wires. Some people find wire management peaceful, I find it frustrating. Nevertheless, it's very important that the wires are properly tucked away to prevent them from getting caught in any of the moving components. When you tuck the wires away, there must be enough slack in the wires such that the carriage can move to the farthest part of the axis without being held back. One common way to manage the extruder wires is to wrap them together in sleeving and suspend them from an anchor point that is higher than the extruder. I chose to use drag chains to manage Zydex's wires. They may be overkill, but they do add to the industrial look, and they also work well. The wires that come with the stepper motors are not long enough to reach the motherboard after being snaked through the drag chains. This is especially true for the extrusion drive and x-axis steppers. Now you can always solder on longer wires, but I've taken a solderless approach by using these screw terminals. They're definitely more expensive than soldering, but they're a good option for people who don't own a soldering iron. I'm now going to wire the power supply to the motherboard, which divides the power among all the electrical components. In the power supply section, we calculated that Zydex is going to need about 300 watts of power. It is very important that the wires from the power supply are capable of safely carrying this much power to the motherboard. If the diameter of the wires is too small for the amount of power it is carrying, then the wires could burn out. So choosing the wrong wire diameter, which is known as the wire gauge in the business, is a serious problem which unfortunately happens all too often. Proper planning can guarantee that you select the correct wires. Let's walk through how I chose the wires between Zydex's power supply and the motherboard. Again, we estimate the power draw of the printer to be 300 watts. At 24 volts, the wires need to supply 12.5 amps of current to reach this power rating. The current is what dictates the gauge of the wire. You can Google maximum current load for each wire gauge, but these charts can vary based on the metal used in the wire and if the wire is solid or stranded core. I find it easier to only buy wire where the maximum current load is listed in the product description. The wires I am using for Zydex are capable of carrying 8 amps of current. Yes, this is lower than 12.5 amps, but I'm using two pairs of these wires because the expansion board has its own power input. I should also mention that these wires have insulation that is rated for relatively high temperature applications, which is a good specification for any wires used when building a 3D printer. This is kind of an obvious statement, but wire management is made easier when the wires are the correct length. However, when cutting wires down to size, you will cut off the end connector if there is one present. To recreate a connector, a crimping tool is used to connect a conductive piece of metal that is then slid into a plastic housing which can accept the male pins of the motherboard. It can take a little practice to perfect your crimping technique, 
but this is a very useful skill for any kind of electronics work. Most people are really intimidated by the process of actually wiring the electronics to the motherboard. I think this stems from the fear of getting positive and negative wires mixed up and accidentally frying the motherboard or the component that was just plugged in. Fortunately, this concern is mitigated by the fact that most 3D printer electronics are blind to the polarity of a circuit. Let me explain through an example. Both the heating element and temperature sensitive resistor of the extruder can be plugged into their corresponding pins in either of the two possible directions and will still operate perfectly fine. It is, however, critical to get the polarity correct for the positive and negative wires coming from the power supply. You should always reference your motherboard's wiring guide and the physical marks on the motherboard to determine which terminal on the motherboard is for the positive power input and which terminal is for the negative power input. But let's walk through the other components to determine if they are sensitive to polarity. The heated bed is also just a fancy resistor so its wires can be connected either way to the heated bed terminals. The limit switch isn't as straightforward. The polarity does not matter, but some of the higher end motherboards have an extra pin to supply the power needed for an optical or magnetic limit switch. But for a mechanical limit switch, you don't need this third pin, so you want to make sure that you don't connect the switch to it. The part cooling and cold end fans are sensitive to polarity in that they will only work if the red wire is connected to the positive pin and the black connected to the negative pin. If this was reversed, it's not the end of the world. The fan would not turn on until the wiring is corrected, but nothing would be damaged. While we are talking about fans, I should also mention that a motherboard cooling fan, or two, is highly recommended as the stepper drivers can run quite hot. The last common 3D printer component would be the stepper motors. And we've already talked at length about all the possible wiring configurations, none of which would hurt the stepper motor or the motherboard. To find the exact location for where to plug in each component, you'll have to consult the wiring guide specific to your motherboard. Well, that wraps up the wiring section. The next big question is, how does the motherboard know what type of 3D printer it's a part of? We will solve this identity crisis in the next section on firmware. <laughs>
but if you make any changes to the original design of the printer, such as making it larger, you will have to manually input these new values into the configurator. So keep watching. We have to set up a custom configuration for Zydex, and for simplicity, I'm gonna configure Zydex as a fixed dual extruder printer. It's actually not possible to configure an independent dual extruder in this web program at the time of recording. That is only possible through direct editing of the configuration file. Don't worry, we'll handle that later. The next page is where you set the printer's geometry and the lengths of the axes. Zydex's linear rails are set up to mimic a Cartesian coordinate system, which is selected by default. The X, Y, and Z maxima are the maximum distances each carriage can move on its rail, which may or may not be the entire length of the rail. The homing preferences are not super important and can be tweaked later. At any point, you can hover your mouse over a field to get more information on that parameter. In the motor tab, we can configure all the stepper motors and drivers. First up, we can set the microstepping level. 1 16th microstepping, denoted here by time 16, is universally selected for 3D printing. Because the Duet uses the trinamic stepper drivers, we can also turn on the microstepping interpolation, which is accomplished through selecting the time 16 with on in parentheses. Next, we have the steps per millimeter. I've gone through this calculation a couple of times in previous sections, but keep in mind that this value is not the full steps per millimeter, but the number of micro steps per millimeter. The next four parameters, max speed change, max speed, acceleration, and motor current are all going to depend on the stepper motor chosen and the weight of each carriage. In the extruder section, we talked about the different extrusion drive setups, direct and Bowden. The motors that are responsible for moving the extruder around in the direct setup will have to move more mass and a lower acceleration and max speed change will have to be used compared to a Bowden setup. There are calculations that can be performed to estimate the optimal values for these parameters, and I will link to these calculations on my website. But most people try and dial in these parameters based on their print quality. If you're having issues with your initial prints, try lowering the max speed change, max speed, and acceleration. It's very common to run the motors at 50 to 80% of their rated current. At 100% current or higher, the motors will run very hot, which is not ideal for printers like Zydex, where some of the stepper motors are being held to the frame by 3D printed parts. If you are using a more budget-friendly motherboard like the Ramps or MKS, you will most likely have to adjust the motor current manually by turning the screw that is directly on the stepper driver. This screw is known as a dash pot, and for the A4988 stepper drivers, turning the dash pot clockwise will increase the motor current while counterclockwise reduces it. In the last column, we will select where each stepper motor is plugged in. Zonix's motherboard has 10 possible stepper drivers, so during wiring, it's important to keep track of which stepper motor is plugged into which stepper driver. Now on to the extrusion drives. We need to add an extra extruder because Zonix has two extrusion drives. These stepper motors are configured similarly to the Axie stepper drivers, but the steps per millimeter will depend on the gearing of the stepper motor. When you are using an underpowered stepper motor for the extrusion drive like I am, you will want to crank the motor current up as high as possible to squeeze a little extra power out of the motors. But I would caution you on doing that because if the stepper motor becomes too hot, it could pass this heat onto the filament. If the filament heats up and becomes soft, it can't be accurately extruded. I don't think I mentioned this during the build, but this is the reason I placed these aluminum heat sinks on the back of the extrusion drive steppers. They help keep them running as cool as possible. We won't worry about the motor current reduction. This is a nice feature, but it's uncommon on most motherboards. Next up, we have the limit switch or end stop parameters. For my X and Y axes, the limit switches are mechanical and wired in a normally closed configuration, as discussed in the limit switch section. They are located at the minima of the rails. The Z axis uses a Z probe instead of a limit switch, and because the Z probe sits above the bed, we have to enter its height in the trigger height field. Let's keep rolling to the heater section. We do have a heated bed and this is checked by default. The control method is an algorithm that maintains the temperature of a heated component based on feedback from the thermistor. Without getting into too much detail, PID or PID is a more accurate way to regulate the temperature of a heated component and is always the preferred method for heating extruders, but for heated beds with large thermal masses, bang bang control is adequate. Next, we have to define the maximum temperature limits for the extruders and heated bed, which is going to be based off specifications supplied by the manufacturers. Since the heated bed comes in contact with a lot of different components, it's important to make sure that all of these components are rated for the maximum temperature limit. We have to add a second nozzle for the second extruder. The PWM limits are fine at 100%. This will allow the heating elements to draw maximum power if needed to reach their set temperatures. 
Finally, the R25, beta, and C values are variables that describe what thermistor is being used to regulate the heater. I don't think I ever fully explained how a thermistor works, but basically it changes resistance proportionally to changes in temperature. The R25 value is the thermistor's resistance at 25 degrees Celsius, and the beta value is a constant that describes how the resistance changes with temperature. To be honest, I'm not sure what the purpose of the C value is, but it can't be too important if it defaults to zero. You saw me install the thermistor on the bottom of the heated bed. But what you didn't see is I found that thermistor at the bottom of a bin and the only thing I knew about it was that its R25 value was 100K. I could calculate the beta and C values by sticking the thermistor in my oven and measuring its resistance at known temperatures, but I have not gotten around to doing that yet. The default values will be fine because precise control over the heated bed is not critical. Fortunately for the nozzles where precise control is important, there is already a default for the thermistors that come with the genuine E3D V6 extruder. If you bought a V6 clone, then the thermistor supplied could be different. So double check this. Before I go to the next tab, I wanted to point out that yes, I am flying through these configuration parameters. When I was planning out this section, I realized that I could probably make a two hour video out of just setting up a configuration file. Then I thought, wait a second, I named this video how to build a 3D printer, not how to program one. I can save myself the effort and just skip this section entirely. But if you watch this video from the beginning, then you're probably very interested in building a 3D printer, and this is the ultimate guide. So I shouldn't leave you hanging. My compromise between telling you everything about configuring the firmware and nothing is what you're watching now. Think of this section as me demystifying the parameters that are required for the printer to work properly and not a thorough explanation. Google and your motherboard's documentation are going to be your friends at this point in the build especially since your firmware will most likely be different from mine. After saying that, I'm going to hurry through these last couple of sections. Next, we need to configure the fans. Zydex has four fans that need to be controlled during a print. Two of these fans are used to keep the cold ends of the two extruders from heating up. Both these fans would be under the thermostatic control of the extruder. For example, once the extruder hits 45 degrees Celsius, the cold end fan should turn on to prevent heat creep. The other two fans are for part cooling. Depending on the type of filament, we may or may not want the cooling fans on. For some reason, the configurator doesn't let me add a fourth fan. With the expansion board, the Duet can control up to nine fans. I will add this fan to the configuration file manually later. In most firmwares, the extruders are called tools. We need to assign each combination of extruder, cold end fan, and part cooling fan to a separate tool. I would also like to point out that the first tool is tool zero and not tool one. The next tab deals with the auto bed leveling settings. Because Zynex's bed is so small, I was able to level it manually, but looking back, this is a pretty useful feature that is absent from the video. I highly recommend for you to look into this feature further, especially if you're building a large format 3D printer. In the second to last tab, we have the network settings because it is a Duet Wi-Fi after all. You connect to the printer over Wi-Fi. Lastly, we can append custom settings to the file, but I find this easier to do in a text editor once we download the configuration file. We'll click finish and then download the file. Opening the system folder, we find a bunch of different text files. We're going to open the config file, but if you're curious, the other files tell the printer what to do if a certain command is issued by the user. For example, maybe when you home the x-axis, you want an LED to turn on. You put the code to turn the LED on in the homeax.g. This organization is specific to the RepRap firmware. Opening the config file in the text editor, we find a well-organized g-code file with all the parameters that we entered into the configuration tool. On the left, we have G and M commands, and on the right, we have comments describing what each command does. According to old CNC books, the G stands for general and the M stands for miscellaneous, which is not helpful at all in describing what these groups of commands do. G commands are typically used for motion and make up 99% of the 3D printer file that is ultimately sent to the printer. I like to think that the M stands for machine-specific commands. This is why a configuration file that contains machine-specific parameters is mostly made up of M commands. G-code is very easy to modify, and I'm going to demonstrate how to add that fourth fan, which happens to be the second extruder's part cooling fan, to the config file. Looking at the block of code that deals with fans, it looks like the M106 command is for adding a fan. Even with the associated comment, it's not totally clear what the P, S, I, and other parameters are doing. The RepRap Wiki's G-Code webpage will give us a little more information on these parameters. As I'm scrolling past all these other commands, I hope this helps you understand why it would be difficult for me to cover all the different commands and impossible for me to create a configuration file that would work for all 3D printers operating on any of the number of firmwares.
While most firmwares use the same G-codes for common operations, the M106 command is a great example with all firmwares using this to set up fans. This is not the case for all commands. Let's continue with setting up our fan. The P parameter is the fan number, which corresponds to a specific fan header on the Duet motherboard. We are setting up our fourth fan, which confusingly would be fan number three because the first fan is zero. The S parameter refers to the fan speed. For RepRap firmware, the fan speed is on a scale from zero to one. The configuration file is executed on startup and we don't want the part cooling fan to turn on until a print starts. So we will set the fan speed to zero. When the printer starts, we can send a command to get the fan to turn on. P and S are the only required parameters, but we can add any of these extra parameters to fine tune other properties of the fan, such as placing it under the thermostatic control of an extruder. This is how the cold end fans for both the extruders are set up in the config file. When the extruder becomes hot, in our case higher than 45 degrees, the cold end fan is switched on. It's best practice to assign a value to as many parameters as possible because left undefined, most of these parameters assume a default value, which may be different than what you would expect. This is why I have added the I parameter, which typically disables fans and set it to zero. Effectively, I have disabled the disabling of the fan. If for some strange reason, this parameter defaulted to something else and prevented the fan from turning on, it would have taken me a while to figure it out. The default frequency for the PWN fan output, or the F parameter, is also 500 Hz, but I have explicitly typed this in. And finally, because the part cooling fan should not be under thermostatic control, I have made sure that it isn't by passing a negative one to the H parameter. And with that, the extra fan is all set up. Obviously, this addition to the configuration file was trivial compared to some of the modifications that need to be made for a more exotic 3D printer like Zydex and its two independent extruders. You can download my configuration file for Zydex at my website if you want to take a look at all the manual changes that had to be made from what was spit out of the configuration tool. I know that I left a lot of stones unturned in this section, but I hope I was able to demystify some of the software setup that was required in building a 3D printer. In the next section on calibration, we'll make sure that the parameters that we input into the firmware translates as expected to real life 3D printer function. <laughs>
So first off, we have the x-axis. We have the y-axis. Now the z-axis lifts up slightly just to make sure that the y-axis doesn't hit anything when it's moving. Then it puts it back. Next we have the z-axis. Well, hold on. We should home the u-axis first. We haven't talked about this yet. We're going to get more into the dual extrusion setup of Zydex in the next section. So we'll go ahead and home this axis. It's known as the u-axis. Then we have to home the z-axis. Again, it lifts up first. It lifts up any time it's about to move the y-axis. I'm going to slide the z-probe in here. and we're good to go. If a carriage fails to home, there is usually a loose wire or there's a mismatch between the wiring of the limit switch and how the configuration file is set up. If you have a Z-probe, like I did, it's important to check that the trigger height is correct. The trigger height is the offset that is applied after the Z-probe is home. Clearly, when Zydex's extruder touches the Z-probe, it is not at Z equals to zero. After correcting for the thickness of the Z-probe, the nozzle of the extruder should be about the thickness of a business card away from the print bed. This same distance goes if you're using a Z-axis limit switch. Now we need to set up the extruder. I had briefly mentioned in the last section that the extruder's temperature is controlled through a feedback algorithm known as PID or PID. To be brief, this algorithm needs to be tuned to smooth out temperature oscillations. I know this sounds complicated, but it is an automatic process that only needs to be completed after installing a new extruder. The auto-tuning is accomplished with a simple G-code command. You will see some temperature fluctuations in the extruder, then after a couple of minutes, the firmware will spit out values for the P, I, and D parameters. You usually have to save them in the firmware through another G-code command. After that, the extruder should be all set up. We will load some filament to check that the extrusion drive is working properly and to prepare for our first print. I'm going to remove the guide tube so that you can see everything that's going on. First, we need to heat up the extruder. It will take about a minute for the hot end to heat up. The cold end fan has turned on, which is really important. If for some reason your cold end fan doesn't turn on, again, you have to go back in the configuration file and make sure it's set to thermostatic control. If you hear even more noise, the uh, power supply fan actually kicked on as well. Now that the hot end has come to temperature, we can have the extrusion drive start to push the filament down into the extruder. You can feel when the hob gears grip the filament and start to pull on it. Oh. <laughs> you can feel when the hob gears start to grab the filament and pull it down. After that, you can let go. While we're waiting, let me explain the purpose of a guide tube. It prevents the filament from getting caught in any of these moving parts, which would cause it to snap. Accurate extrusion of the filament is very important for print quality. To make sure that the extrusion drive is pushing out the right amount of filament, we will double check that when instructed to extrude 100 millimeters of filament, that, well, 100 millimeters of filament is extruded. I typically use a Sharpie to mark the filament 100 millimeters above the cold end. If all goes well, then that black mark will be barely visible above the cold end after extrusion. This method doesn't result in the most accurate measurement, but it should tell us if we're in the ballpark. Later on, if the printer is under or over extruding, we can make minor adjustments to the filament flow rate through a parameter known as an extrusion multiplier. Zydex's extrusion drive seems to be extruding appropriately. If you find that your black mark is either inside of the extruder or way above it, then most likely your extrusion drive's steps per millimeter is incorrect where the filament is slipping at the hob gear. Most extrusion drives have some sort of tensioner that can be increased to prevent slipping. It's time for Zydex's first print. What will it be? Can I get a drum roll? It's gonna be a cube. Okay, maybe a little anticlimactic, but a cube can tell us a lot about the accuracy and alignment of a printer. You can find a printable cube online or you can create one in a CAD program like Fusion 360. 
Just make sure you know the dimensions. In my case, the cube is 30 millimeters by 30 millimeters by 30 millimeters. We need to convert the 3D file describing the cube into G code because that is what 3D printers understand. This is accomplished through a software program known as a slicer. My favorite slicer is Simplify 3D because it is compatible with many different types of 3D printers. Before importing the cube into your slicer of choice, it's important to make sure that this software understands your printer setup. Simplify 3D has a configuration assistant for setting up new printers that allows you to input custom parameters after selecting other. In Zydex's case, I only have to change the name and build volume and check that Zydex has a heated bed. When we set up the second extruder in the next section, we'll have to make a couple more changes, but for a single extruder setup, we're good to go. Next, I will import the cube into Simplify 3D and then pull up the settings for the print. To keep it easy, I'm going to keep the default settings for PLA, which is the plastic you saw me load into the printer. After that, we click Prepare to Print and Simplify 3D converts the cube into G-code. Simplify 3D can send the G-code directly to a 3D printer if it's connected by USB. But Zydex is a wireless printer, so I will save the G-code and then upload it to the web interface. The print bed and extruder will heat up, and then the print will start. The first layers of the print are critical, as I talked about in the heated bed section. If there's an issue with these layers, then it is most likely one of two problems. Either the nozzle is not the appropriate distance away from the bed, or the bed surface is not suitable for polymer adhesion and needs to be treated with some sort of adhesive. As each layer goes down, I'm checking to make sure that all the printer's movements are smooth. If the extruder or the bed accelerates or moves too quickly, then the stepper motors can miss steps, leading to erratic movements. If you observe these type of movements on your printer, then I recommend turning down the print speeds and accelerations. It's kind of hard to see on the video, but as the filament is being laid down for the top layers of the cube, there's a small amount of space between strands. This suggests that the extruder is not depositing enough filament, and thus the flow rate, or extrusion multiplier, needs to be increased. The extrusion multiplier varies from filament type, so it's not uncommon to have to adjust this setting in the slicer software. I am guessing that this under extrusion will result in my cube being slightly undersized. Let's go ahead and measure it. Recall that the cube was designed to have a width, height, and length of 30 millimeters. Now there's going to be some irregularities in the 3D printing process, so we can expect a small amount of error, but too much deviation from 30 millimeters would indicate that the steps per millimeter for the motors are not correct. As predicted, the X and Y dimensions of the cube are slightly undersized. I felt a little slack in Zydex's X-axis belting, which may account for it being slightly more off in dimension than the Y-axis. I will fix this off camera. If the cube looks slanted in any direction, then chances are your axes are not perpendicular to the print bed. It's relatively safe to assume that once you have successfully printed a cube, then your printer and firmware configuration files are set up correctly. From this point on, you shouldn't have to edit the firmware's configuration. However, you will have to edit the settings in your slicer to really hone in quality prints. After the cube, I always print the world's famous Benchy to determine what slicer settings need adjusting. Benchy is the perfect torture test for a new 3D printer because it has many different types of geometries. After the print is finished, I thoroughly inspect the little boat for imperfections. From afar, Benchy looks pretty good, but closer up there are a couple of issues. For example, there are some indents in the bow of the boat that are indicative of not enough extrusion at the start of each layer, and there is sagging in the arches of the doors and in the front window. The sagging can be fixed by increasing the part cooling fan speed, decreasing the extrusion temperature, and slowing down the print speeds. I've been 3D printing for a while, so I usually know the causes for these imperfections. When I first started, I would have to Google my Benchy specific problem, and nine out of 10 times, someone else had the exact same issue and posted the solution. There's about a million other things I could say about calibrating the settings for a 3D print, but it's best to learn through experimenting. My one recommendation is to stick with one type of 3D filament in the beginning, because as I had mentioned, filament made out of different plastics or even from different manufacturers will need different print settings. In the next section, we will unlock Zydex's second extruder. <laughs> Do you know where Zydex gets its name? Well, it's kind of an acronym. There's a new breed of 3D printers on the market known as independent dual extruders. Unlike my Maker Gear M2, which has two extruders fixed to a single axis, these new 3D printers have extruders that can move independently of each other. One benefit of this design is that the second extruder can be moved out of the way when it is not in use. I can't tell you how many times my dual prints failed on my Maker Gear from unwanted oozing of the idle extruder. 
This ooze would get caught on the part that is being printed, and after cooling, it would obstruct the extruder that is printing, which would often cause the part to get knocked off. The other benefit to this setup is the ability to print two identical parts simultaneously by using both extruders at the same time. I never demoed this on Zydex because the bed is too small, but this is a really cool feature, especially if you are printing a lot of the same parts. Now the connection to Zydex's name is that independent dual extruders are abbreviated as IDEX. As far as I know, all consumer level IDEX printers only have independent X axes. Zydex's extruders can not only be controlled independently in the X axis, but also in the Z axis. Hence why this printer is called Zydex. Being able to control the Z heights of the extruders independently allows you to make sure that the nozzles are at the same height automatically with the use of a Z probe. Before we start setting up the second extruder, let me quickly talk about the pros and cons of building a printer with an additional extruder. The only con that I can think of is cost. IDEX 3D printers cost more to build because you have to buy more parts. This is pretty self-explanatory, but the hidden cost is usually having to buy a more expensive motherboard like the Duet that can support the additional stepper drivers. However, most low-end motherboards will support fixed dual extrusion, and in that setup, the only added cost is the second extruder and the extrusion drive. In my opinion, the ability to print multi-material and multi-color parts far outweigh the cost. Whenever I'm designing a model that I know will be 3D printed, I try and design it in such a way that it won't require support, but sometimes overhangs are unavoidable. For this reason, I always have a supply of PVA, which is a water-soluble filament that I can toss into the second extruder. I will then set the second extruder to be in charge of printing the support material. After the print is finished, I toss the part into hot water, which dissolves the support structures. Even though PVA is pricey, it's a godsend when printing complex parts with fragile features. To be honest though, I'm most thankful for my second extruder when I'm running late to get a print started and my first extruder is jammed or out of filament. I can just switch the print over to my second extruder and deal with the other extruder when I have more time. Okay, that was a lot more talking than I meant to do. The setup for this second extruder is identical to the first, so I did most of it off camera. This includes auto-tuning the heating system, measuring the extrusion distances, and printing the cube. After these calibrations, either extruder could be used to print a part. However, there is one last parameter we need to configure before our first dual extrusion print, which is the offset between the extruders. In dual extrusion prints, the incoming extruder has to be able to take over from where the outgoing extruder finished. For this to occur smoothly, the distance between the two extruders must be known. It can be awkward to measure the offset of the two extruders with calipers because yes, you need to know the Y offset, but you also need to measure the X offset. We don't know that these two extruders home to the exact same location on their corresponding axes. I still try to get a ballpark measurement with my calipers, but we will fine tune these offset values in the future with a dedicated calibration print. We have to input these rough values into the configuration file. Typically the offsets are in relationship to the first extruder, so we only need to list these X and Y offsets for the second extruder. I had to make these values negative because of the direction of the axes and the offsets. Our first dual extrusion print will be a series of cubes stacked on top of each other. The extruders will alternate the printing of these cubes. If the cubes are not perfectly aligned, then the offset values need to be adjusted. Fortunately, it is much easier to measure the alignment of the cubes with calipers. I will repeat this calibration print three or four times until the transition from the red cube to the blue cube is seamless. Once I'm happy with the offsets, I move on to printing a dual extrusion version of Benchy to fine tune my print settings. I start with a slightly enlarged Benchy because it is easier to print and to spot problems. The most common issue with dual extrusion parts is the unwanted oozing of the idle extruder. This ooze can be controlled by playing with the extrusion temperatures and retraction distance, but these settings are dependent on the filament being used. To avoid having to precisely calibrate these settings for each filament, I recommend using a prime tower or ooze shield, which is an additional structure that is printed next to your part. This structure will catch unwanted oozes and ensure the extruder is ready to print. Once I'm satisfied with this big benchy, I will print the normal size benchy, and then typically I'm able to print other multi-material objects without too much trouble. I do print the offset calibration every now and then to make sure that the extruders are not drifting over time. This section has been an abbreviated look at setting up dual extrusion prints. If you've never attempted a multi-material part, I'm sure that you still have many questions. Fortunately, there is no shortage of dual extrusion resources online, and I will write up some additional material that will be on my website. This is actually a great segue into the next and final section on the many extra resources that are available to you.
When I was building my first 3D printer, the biggest problem was that I didn't know what I didn't know. It was only when I encountered a problem that I realized, wait a second, this is not wired properly, or oops, that was the wrong component. While I learned a lot from this trial and error method, it was a frustrating and expensive way to build a 3D printer. My original goal was to share my previous mistakes so that others can avoid them. But then I realized, wait a second, I made a lot of mistakes. So that original idea morphed into this massive video. Even with all this time, it was not possible for me to fully explain all the concepts that go into 3D printing. The perfect example of this is the stepper driver section. You may now understand the importance of the stepper driver and how to wire a motor to it, but the exact features offered by different stepper drivers may still be unclear. But now you know that not all stepper drivers are created equally and you can investigate which stepper driver will be best for your printer. To help continue your 3D printer research, I've compiled all the resources I use to make this video on my website. Maybe you're ready now to dive in and build your own 3D printer, but have not decided on a printer design. Well, don't worry, I have you covered. I put together my top list of DIY 3D printers. On the other hand, maybe 3D printing still interests you, but this video has scared you away from building a printer because of the complexity and time required. If this is the case, it may be better to buy a fully assembled printer. I have also compiled my top list of commercially available 3D printers that are ready to go right out of the box. Whether you build or buy a 3D printer, please consider posting your questions and prints on the Dr. D Flow forum. My dream is to build an engaged online community around CNC machines where people can ask questions, share their projects, and talk about new technologies. Well, that's the end of the video. I hope you found it informative while not being too dense. With a video this long, there are bound to be a couple of irregularities. So let me know in the comment section below if you need clarification on any of the topics presented. It wasn't just me working on this video. I wanted to quickly thank Andy, who helped at every stage of this little production, and Eric, who makes all the awesome Dr. D Flow animations. I just finished building my garage workshop, which is a huge step up from my previous videos that were filmed on the couch in my bedroom. So make sure you're subscribed because I have a lot of exciting projects coming up.